Chapter 11 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bell was falling head first when the chute opened, and the jerk was terrific, the more so as he had counted not the customary ten, but fifteen before pulling out the ring. But very suddenly he seemed to be floating down with an amazing gentleness, with a ruddy blossom of a parachute swaying against the background of lustrous stars very far indeed over his head. Below him were masses of smoke and at least one huge dancing mass of flame, where the storage tank for airplane gas had exploded. It was unlikely in the extreme he saw now that anyone under that canopy of smoke could look up to see plainer parachute against the sky. Clumsily enough, dangling as he was, Bell twisted about to look for Paula. Sheer panic came to him before he saw her a little above him but a long distance off. She looked horribly alone with the glare of the fires upon her parachute and smoke that trailed away into darkness below her. She was farther from their flames than Bell, too. The light upon her was dimmer, and Bell cursed that he had stayed in the plane to make sure it would dive clear of her before he stepped off himself. The glow on the blossom of silk above her faded out. The sky still glared behind, but a thick and acrid fog enveloped Bell as he descended. Still straining his eyes hopelessly, he crossed his feet and waited. Branches reached up and lashed at him. Vines scraped against his sides. He was hurled against a tree trunk with stunning force and rebounded, and swung clear, and then dangled halfway between earth and the jungle roof. It was a minute before his head cleared, and then he felt at once despairing and a fool, dangling in his parachute harness when Paula needed him. The light in the sky behind him penetrated even the jungle growth as a faint luminosity. Presently, he writhed to a position in which he could strike a match. A thick, matted mass of climbing vines swung from the upper branches, not a yard from his fingertips. Bell cursed again, frantically, and clutched at it wildly. Presently, his absurd kicking set him to swaying. He redoubled his efforts and increased the arc in which he swung, but it was a long time before his fingers closed upon leaves which now came away in his grasp, and longer still before he caught hold of a wrist-thick liana which oozed sticky sap upon his hand. But he clung desperately and presently got his whole weight on it. He unsnapped the parachute and partly let himself down, partly slid, and partly tumbled to the solid earth below. He had barely reached it when, muffled and many times re-echoed among the tree trunks, he heard two shots. He cursed and sprang toward the sound, plunging headlong into underbrush that strove to tear the flesh from his bones. He fought madly, savagely, fiercely. He heard two more shots, he fought the jungle in the darkness like a madman, plowing insanely through masses of creepers that should have been parted by a machete, and which would have been much more easily slipped through by separating them, but which he strove to penetrate by sheer strength. And then he heard two shots again. Bell stopped short and swore disgustedly. What a fool I am, he growled. She's telling me where she is, and I... He drew one of the weapons that seemed to bulge in every pocket of his flying suit and fired two shots in the air in reply. A single one answered him. From that time, Bell moved more sanely. The jungle is not designed, apparently, for men to travel in. It is assuredly not intended for them to travel in by night, and especially it is not planned by whoever planned it, for a man to penetrate without either machete or lights. As nearly as he could estimate it afterward, it took Bell over an hour to cover one mile in the blackness under the jungle roof. 
Once he blundered into fire ants. They were somnolent in the darkness, but one hand stung as if in white-hot metal as he went on. And thorns tore at him. The heavy flying suit protected him somewhat, but after the first hundred yards he blundered almost blindly on, with his arms across his face, stopping now and then to try to orient himself. Three times he fired in the air, and three times an answering shot came instantly to guide him. And then a voice called in the blackness, and he plowed toward it, and it called again and again, and at last he struck a match with trembling fingers and saw her dangling as he had dangled some fifteen feet from the ground. She smiled waveringly with a little gasp of relief, and he heard something go slithering away very furtively. She clung to him desperately when he had gotten her down to solid earth, but he was savage. Those shots, though I'm glad you fired them, may have been a tip-off to the town. We've got to keep moving, Paula. Her breath was coming quickly. They could trail us, Charles. By daylight, we might not leave signs. But forcing our way through the night... Right as usual, admitted Bell. How about shells? Did you use all you had? Nearly. But I was afraid, Charles. Bell felt in his pockets half a box perhaps twenty-five shells. With the town nearby, and almost certainly having heard their signals to each other, black rage invaded Bell. They would be hunted for, of course. Dogs, perhaps, would trail them. And the thing would end when they were at bay, ringed about by the master slaves, with twenty-five shells only to expend. The dim little glow in the sky between the jungle leaves kept up. It was bright and slowly growing brighter. There was a sudden flickering, and even the jungle grew light for an instant. A few seconds later, there was a heavy concussion. Something else went up, growled Bell. It's some satisfaction, anyway, to know that I did a lot of damage. And then, quite abruptly, there was an obscure murmuring sound. It grew stronger and stronger still. If Bell had been aloft, he would have seen the planes from the master's hangars being rushed out of their shelters. One of a long row of buildings had caught, and the plateau of Cuaba is very far from civilization. Tools and even dynamos and engines could be brought toilsomely to it, but the task would be terrific. Buildings would be made from materials on the spot, even the shelters for the planes. It would be much more practical to carry the parts for a sawmill and saw out the lumber on the spot than to attempt to freight roofing materials and the like to Cuyaba. So that the structures Bell had seen in the wing lights glow were of wood and inflammable. The powerhouse that lighted the landing field was already ablaze. The smaller shacks of the laborers, perhaps, would not be burnt down but the elaborate depot for communications by plane and wireless was rapidly being destroyed. The reserve gasoline had gone up in smoke almost at the beginning, and in spreading out had extended the disaster to nearly all the compact nerve center of the whole conspiracy. Presently the droning noise was tumultuous. Every plane in a condition to fly was out on the landing field now brightly lighted by the burning buildings all about. There was frantic, hectic activity everywhere. The secretaries of the master were rescuing what records they could, and growing cold with terror. In the confusion of spreading flames and the noise of roaring conflagrations, the stopping of the motor up aloft had passed unnoticed. In the headquarters of the master there was panic. An attack had been made upon the master. A person who could not be one of his slaves had found his stronghold and attacked it terribly. And if one man knew that location and dared to attack it, then... The hold of the master upon all his slaves was based on one fact and its corollary. The fact was that those who had been given his poison 
would go murder mad without its antidote. The corollary was that those who obeyed him would be given that antidote and be safe. True, the antidote was but a temporary one. Mixed with it, for administration, was a further dosage of the poison itself. But the whole power of the master was based on his slave's belief that as long as they obeyed him abjectly, there would be no failure of the antidote supply. And Bell had given that belief a sudden and horrible shock. Orders came from one frightened man, who cursed much more from terror than from rage. Ribiera had advised him. To do him justice, Ribiera felt less fear than most. Nephew to the master, and destined successor to the master's power, Ribiera dared not revolt, but at least he had little fear of punishment for incompetence. It was his advice that set the many aircraft motors warming up. It was his direction that assorted out the brainwork staff, and Ribiera himself curtly took control, indifferently abandoned the enslaved workers to the madness that would come upon them, and took wing in the last of a stream of roaring things that swept upward above the smoke and flame and vanished in the sky. Bell and Paula were huddled in between the buttress roots of a jungle giant, protected on three sides by the monster uprearing of solid wood, and Bell was absorbedly feeding a tiny smudge fire. The smoke was thick and choking, but it did keep off the plague of insects which make jungle travel much less than the romantic adventure it is pictured. Bell heard the heavy, thunderous buzzing from the town change timber suddenly. A single note of it grew loud and soared overhead. He stared up instinctively, but saw nothing but leaves and branches and many climbing things above him, dimly lighted by the smoky little blaze. The roaring overhead went on and dimmed. A second roaring came from the town and rose to a monstrous growling and diminished. A third did likewise, and a fourth. At stated even intervals, the planes at the headquarters of the master took off from the landing field, ringed about with blazing buildings, and plunged through the darkness in a straight line. The steadier droning from the town grew lighter as the jungles echoed for many miles with the sounds of aircraft motors overhead. At last a single plane rose upward and thundered over the jungle roof. It went away and away. The town was silent then, and only a faint and dwindling murmur came from the line of aircraft headed south. "'They've deserted the town, by God,' said Bell, his eyes gleaming. "'Scared off.' "'And we?' said Paula, gazing at him. "'You can bet that every man who could crowd into a plane did so,' said Bell, grimly. "'Those that couldn't, if they had any brains, will be trying to make it some other way to where they can subject themselves to one of the master's deputies and have a little longer time of sanity. The poor devils that are left, well, they'll be camaradas, peons, laborers, without the intelligence to know what they can do. They'll wait patiently for their masters to come back, and presently their hands will writhe, and the town will be a hell. Then they won't bother looking for us. Bell considered, and suddenly he laughed. If the fire is burned out before dawn, he said coldly, I'll go looking for them. It's going to be cold-blooded, and it's going to be rather pitiful, I think. But there's nothing else to do. You try to get some rest. You'll need it. And for all the rest of the dark hours, he crouched in the little angle formed by the roots of the forest giant, and kept the thickly smoking little fire going, and listened to the noises of the jungle all about him. It was more than a mile back to the town. It was nearer, too. But it was vastly less difficult to force a way through the thick growths by daylight, even though then it was not easy. With machetes, of course, Bell and Paula would have had no trouble. But theirs had been left in the plain. Bell made a huge club and battered openings by sheer strength, 
where it was necessary. Sweat streamed down his face before he had covered five hundred yards, and then something occurred to him, and he went more easily. If there were any of the intelligent class of the master's subjects left in the little settlement, he wanted to allow time enough for them to start their flight. He wanted to find the place empty of all but laborers, who would be accustomed to obey any man who spoke arrogantly and in the manner of a deputy of the master. Yet he did not want to wait too long. Panic spreads among the camarada class as swiftly as among more intelligent folk, and it is even more blind and hysterical. It was nearly eleven o'clock before they emerged upon a cleared field where brightly blooming plants grew hugely. Bell regarded these grimly. These, he observed, will be the master's stock. Paula touched his arm. I have heard, she said, and shuddered, that the men who gather the plants that go to make the poisons of the Indios do not, do not dare to sleep near the fresh-picked plants. They say that the odor is dangerous, even the perfume of the blossoms. Very probably, said Bell, I wish I could destroy the damn things, but since we can't, why, we'll go around the edge of the field. He went upwind, skirting the edge of the planted things. A path showed winding over half-heartedly cleared ground. He followed it, with Paula close behind him. Smoke still curled heavily upward from the heaps of ashes, which he reached first of all. He looked upon them with an unpleasant satisfaction. He had to pick his way between still smoking heaps of embers to reach the huts about which laborers stood listlessly, not working because not ordered to work, not yet frightened because not yet realizing fully the catastrophe that had come upon them. He was moving toward them, deliberately adopting an air of suppressed rage, when a voice called whiningly, Senor, Senor, and then pleading in Portuguese, I have news for the master, I have news for the master. Bell jerked his head about. Bars of thick wood cemented into heavy timber at tops and bottom. A building that was solid wall on three sides, and the fourth was bars. A white man in it, unshaven, haggard, ragged, filthy, and on the floor of the cage. There had been another such cage on the fazenda back toward Rio. Bell had looked into it and had shot the gibbering thing that had been its occupant as an act of pure mercy. But this man had been through horrors and yet was sane. Don't look, said Bell sharply to Paula. He went close. The figure pressed against the bars, whining, and suddenly it stopped its fawning. The devil, said the white man in the cage. What the hell are you doing here, Bell? Has that fiend caught you too? Oh, my God, gasped Bell. He went white with cold rage. He had known this man before, a secret service man, one of the seven who had vanished. How is this place opened? I'll let you out. It may be dangerous, said the white man, with a ghastly grin. I'm one of the master's little victims. I've been trying to work a little game in hopes of getting within arm's reach of him. How'd you get here? Has he got you, too? I burned the damn town last night, snarled Bell, and crashed up after it. Where's the door? He found it, a solid mass of planks with a log bar, fitted in such a way that it could not possibly be opened from within. He dragged it wide. The white man came out, holding to his self-control with an obvious effort. I want to dance and sing because I'm out of there, he told Bell queerly, but I know you've done me no good. I've been fed the master's little medicine. I've been in that cage for weeks. Bell, quivering with rage, handed him a revolver. I'm going to get some supplies and stuff and try to make it to civilization, he said shortly. If you want to help. Hell yes, said the white man drearily. I might as well. 
Number 114 was here. He's the master's little pet now. Turn traitor. Report it if you ever get out. No, said Bell briefly. He didn't turn. He told in a very few words of the finding of the body of a man who had fallen or been thrown from a plane into the jungle. They were moving toward the rows of still-standing shacks then, and faces were beginning to turn toward them. There was a little stir of apathetic puzzlement at sight of the white man who had been set free. That white man looked suddenly at Paula and then at Bell. I've been turned into a beast, he said wryly. Look here, Bell. There was many as ten and fifteen of us in that cage at one time. Men, the deputy sent up for the purpose. We were allowed to go mad, one and two at a time, for the edification of the populace, to keep the camarada scared. And those of us who weren't going mad just then used to have to band together and kill them. That cage has been the most awful hell on earth that any devil ever contrived. They put three women in there once, with their hands already writhing. Ugh. Bell's face was cold and hard, as if carved from marble. I haven't lived through it, said the white man harshly, by being soft, and I've got less than no time to live, saying, anyhow, I was thinking of shooting you in the back because the young lady... He laughed as Bell's revolver muzzle stirred. I'm telling you, said the white man in ghastly merriment, because I thought, I thought, 114 had set me the example of ditching the service for his own life, but now it's different. He pointed. There's a launch in that house with one of those outboard motors. It was used to keep up communication with the boat gangs that swept the heavy supplies up the river. It'll float in three inches of water, and you can pole it where the water's too shallow to let the propeller turn. This rabble will mob you if you try to take it, because it'll have taken them just about this long to realize that they're deserted. They'll think you are a deputy, at least, to have dared release me. I'm going to convince them of it and use this gun to give you a start. I'll give you two hours, it ought to be enough, and then... Bell nodded. I'm not service, he said curtly, but I'll see it's known. The white man laughed again. Some sigh for the glories of this world, and some for a prophet's paradise to come, he quoted derisively. I thought I was hard, Bell, but I find I prefer to have my record clean in the service, where nobody will ever see it, than to take what pleasures I might snatch before I die. Queer, isn't it? Old Omar was wrong. Now watch me bluff, flinging away the cash for credit of doubtful value, and all for the rumble of a distant drum, which will be muted. They were surrounded by swarming, fawning, frightened camaradas, who implored the senor to tell them if he were a deputy of the master, and if he were here to make sure nothing evil befell them. They worked for the master, and they desired nothing save to labor all their lives for the master. Only, only the master would allow no evil to befall them. The white man waved his arms grandiloquently. The senor you behold, he proclaimed, in the barbarous Portuguese of the hinterland of Brazil, has released me from the cage in which you saw me. He is the deputy of the master himself, and is enraged because the landing lights on the field were not burning, so that his airplane fell down into the jungle. He bears news of great value from me to the master, which will make me finally a sub-deputy of the master, and I have a revolver, as you see, with which I could kill him. But he dares not permit me to die, since I have given him news for the master. I shall wait here, and he will go, and send back an airplane with the grace of the master for me and for all of you. Bell snarled an assent in the arrogant fashion of the deputies of the master. He waited furiously while the service man argued eloquently and fluently. He fingered his revolver suggestively when a wave of panic swept over the swarming mob 
for no especial reason. And then he watched grimly, while the light little metal-bottomed boat was carried to the water's edge and loaded with food and fuel and arms and ammunition, and even mosquito bars. The white man grinned queerly at Bell as he extended his hand in a last handshake. I, who am about to die, salute you, he said mockingly. Isn't this a hell of a world, Bell? I'm sure we could design a better one in some ways. Bell felt a horrible, ghastly shock. The hand that gripped his was writhing in his grasp. Quite so, said the white man. It started about five minutes ago. In theory, I have about forty-eight hours. Actually, I don't dare wait that long. If I'm to die like a white man, and a lingering vanity insists on that. I hope you get out, Bell. And if you want to do me a favor, he grinned again, mirthlessly, you might see that the master, and as many of his deputies as you can manage, join me in hell at the earliest possible moment. I shan't mind so much if I can watch them. He put his hands quickly in his pockets as the little outboard motor caught and the launch went on down river. He did not even look after them. The last Bell saw of him, he was swaggering back up the little hillside above the river's edge, surrounded by scared inhabitants of the working men's shacks, and scoffing in superior fashion at their fears. End of chapter 11